Hey everybody, welcome back to Worship here at Open Table. I'm Jason, the pastor here, and we are so glad you are tuning in to our worship today. I hope that you're blessed. I hope that this experience here, that this little short 30 minutes lifts you up, gives you something good to hold on to, fills your life with love, and brings you closer to Christ. Thanks for being part of this church and for following us here online. Today, our call to worship is Psalm 105. Hear these words. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to the Lord. Sing praises. Tell of all God's wondrous works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and God's strength. Seek the Lord's presence continually. Remember the wonderful works God has done, the miracles and judgments God has uttered. Amen. Let us lift up our hearts as we go in worship and prayer and teaching to Christ. Happy Sunday again. So I have some good news for us. We have been approved. We had met with the council last week, and so we've been approved to move back inside. Seems like things in North Carolina, the numbers are going down. And um, so we're going to be moving worship back inside beginning October the 4th. Of course, we'll need masks and we'll social distance in there. But oh, it's going to be so good to actually be in that space once again for worship. And if you're still not ready, we understand that many of you still aren't ready uh, to come to be inside to worship. And that is totally fine. We'll continue the, the online streaming for everybody and we'll, we'll continue to do that probably forever. So we'll, you'll have that option for everybody as we move forward. But I'm looking forward to seeing us again inside and I know that's going to be exciting. Today we are continuing in the, the parables. The lectionary sort of pauses here in several of Jesus's parables. So last week we talked about the parable of the unjust uh, servant and this week we're talking about the parable of the vineyard. All of these have a similar theme in Matthew and they're all talking about and asking us the question, what sort of world do you want to live in? What sort of world is God's kingdom? And what sort of world can we create that is debt free for all people? I, I love the brain, if you all know me. I study the brain a lot. And one of the things that, that is fascinating about the brain is it's programming for self preservation. We're programmed for self-preservation in our brains. Like everything that we do revolves around self-preservation. You know, when we are feel a threat, what do we do? We fight, we flight, or we freeze. And all that is based around this idea of how do I preserve myself? That's what the brain does. It keeps you alive. And that's its primary objective in life. And so I think one of the great tasks of spirituality is not how do we overcome sin, because sin is just a symptom of something else. The great task of spirituality 
is how can we rewire the brain's program out of self-preservation? How do we overcome the drive for self-preservation? Because when we are allowed to, when we follow in that footsteps of our brain for self-preservation, we begin to see the world as a threat. Anything that we don't agree with, or we don't understand, or we haven't experienced before, we see as a threat. And it's very difficult in this space of self-preservation to be a generous people. But in Christ, we are called to be generous people. We are called to pour out our life as an offering for the world around us. To put others before ourselves, to love others, to love our neighbor, to love the world. And we simply cannot do that if all we're consumed with is self-preservation. And it is exactly this drive for self-preservation that leads us into the sin of hatred, abuse, neglect, injustice. I think our task is that. To be different people. To change our hearts. But not, only, not just our hearts, but the way that we operate in the world towards self-preservation, from self-preservation to free self-giving. This is what God is, right? God is a giving God. And God is free to give as God chooses. I was reading this week, Richard Rohr, and he was talking about, as he does so brilliantly, about the two halves of life. Like the first half of life, where we construct an identity. What he says is the first half of life, we are busy building a container for our life. Like, you know, a container that we put everything in. That we construct that, our identity, our goals, our dreams. Like this is who we are going to be. But the second part of life is when we realize we have to put something in that container. The first part of life, we built a container. And then the second part of life is we find the things that we want to put into the container. The sort of people we want to be. The sort of things that we want to stand for. The sort of way that we want to really live in the world. And he talks about this idea and that oftentimes, sometimes people never get to the second part of life. Sometimes people get there early. Some people will get there late, but usually it takes some sort of big event to shake us up in some way for us to realize, whoa, what's in my container? Maybe nothing's there. Maybe I need to put something in there. And usually in that point, in the second point of life, so after something shakes us up, we do have more capacity to move from self-preservation, the container, to what we want to put into that container, seeing life as a gift the gifts that we can put inside our container. This week we have two texts in the lectionary. The first is Jonah, and I'm not going to read the text to you because we all know it, right? We know the story of Jonah, that Jonah, God told Jonah, Jonah, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel or tell them the good news. It wasn't the gospel, but I want you to tell them about me in the, here in the Hebrew scriptures. And, and Jonah's like, no way, I'm not going to do that. And so Jonah runs and with this whole beautiful narrative of God uh, chasing Jonah down. And finally Jonah relinquishes and relents and goes to Nineveh and tells the Ninevites about God's great love. And the Ninevites repent and they change. And you would think, right, the story would th you would think like Jonah would be happy about that. Like, yes, God is good and the Ninevites believe. And, but Jonah's mad. He's mad. He's livid. And he goes out and he's mad at God. And he says to God, I knew it. This is why I didn't want to come to Nineveh because I knew you were merciful and I knew you were good and I knew you would allow them to repent and I knew that they would. And so Jonah here is so indignantly mad at God's generosity for other people. And Jonah goes out to the, this, the, into, the, into the desert and he's pouting and he's moping and he's mad. And, and God brings this bush to give Jonah shade. But then the bush dies and Jonah gets really mad about that. He's like, God, why did you cause this bush to die? And God says to Jonah, do you care more about the bush than you do the Ninevites? Jonah's like, yes, I do. I do. And God's like, why? Why do you get mad at my generosity? Can't, and am I, God, not free to love the Ninevites more than the bush? 
And so here we, we get into the, like we're all Jonah, right? We're all facing these sort of things of like, how are we going to live? Are we going to live in generosity and freeness and goodness for everybody around us? Where we, where we are free, that we allow God to be generous to every single person? Or do we care more about the bush than we do people's lives? Do we care more about shop windows than we do for justice? And so here this all brings us into this theme today of this parable that Jesus teaches. In Matthew 20, here it is. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for the vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He said, hey, y'all, you, you, you want to work, come work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And he went out again about noon, about, noon, about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon and went out and found others and he did the same thing. He said, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his supervisor, call the workers and pay them their wages. And beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first, the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them received the same, a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I, I'm doing nothing unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for denarii? Take your pay and go. If I want to give who was, I want to give the ones who worked the least the same as you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. What is opposite of generosity? Is it stinginess? No, it's envy. When we are envious, we cannot be generous. When we see someone as not worthy of receiving generosity, then we're envious. Then we cannot be generous to them. I, this parable is, is about how do you want to live? What kind of world do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a world where we, we, like, you, you want to be equal and fair? But God is not equal or fair. This is what I, the conversation I have with my kids, right? They're like, but this isn't fair, Dad. And I'm like, nothing's fair. What's fair? It's not fair that you get all of this in your life and so many others don't. It's not fair that Jesus died for us. None of it's fair. Life is not fair. But life and God can be generous. And so how do we live in this world of generosity? And I think like this parable sums up, I think, so much of what we're in right now. Where so many people feel like we're not getting what we deserve. How often it's like, we, we always see like me not getting, I, I don't get what I deserve. You're not giving me enough. But oftentimes we don't see ourselves as needing to give more, right? Why is that? If all of us in the world feel like we're, we need more, then like that's not, that's not balanced. Some people need to give, some need to, people need to receive. It's, it, it's, it's in the middle. So like what kind of world do we want to live in here? We want to live in a world where we are, we're fighting over fairness. Or maybe we could... Live in a world that is generous, that we are freely seeking to give others benefits, that we are seeking to let, let others have grace, that we are seeking to empower other people as much as we possibly can. For we see our role. Yes, we may have worked more in this instant and maybe we feel like we deserve more, but God is free to do what God wants to do. And I know that God wants to be generous, freely, bestowing life and grace and possibility and a future flourishing for every single person. Not just me, but everyone. I think when we worry about the bush that planted and we see it fall, we worry about our money, we worry about our position, we worry about those things that we value more, and we put those above other people's lives. We're being like Jonah. We're caring more about the, the possession, the thing, than someone's life. But I think we're called to be more than that. 
as people. And this is where this self-preservation thing comes in. The, the workers of the, the early workers, they were just trying to preserve their future. They were trying to preserve themselves and they saw the other ones as a threat. But the moment we see someone as a threat, we cannot love them. It's impossible because we will fight or we will flee or we will freeze. And so in this sense, this parable is inviting us into a world where we don't see each other as threats, where we don't see each other as against one another. We don't live in a zero-sum world. And what I mean by that, zero-sum, is like if there was a pizza and you took a piece, that means there's one less piece for me. If there was a pizza and you took half of it, that means I only get half. Or if you took three quarters of it, I only get a quarter. That's not the world. We don't live in a world of scarcity. We live in God's world of abundance. And so shouldn't we be excited and happy that those workers who were going to have no wages today, they couldn't feed their families today, they had no job, but in the last moment somebody came and gave them work and now they can provide for their family, they can have blessing, they can have a future. Shouldn't we be happy and excited? And I agreed to work for the same. So like, there is no unfairness here. It is all good. Shouldn't we see the world as a world of abundance, not of scarcity? Shouldn't we be working and using our resources and our talents and our blessings to pour out our lives for the benefit of others and not squabbling over like, well, they didn't do this right, or they didn't do that right, or they didn't follow this, or they didn't do that, and they didn't even... No. We're called for more. And so that, in that sense, we need to overcome our self-preservation. We need to overcome this sense of seeing everybody as a threat. And we need to see everyone as loved, as good, as beautiful. And our lives are intersecting their lives in this moment so that we can be a blessing, so that we can relieve their debt, so that we can help empower their future, so that we can care more about their future than the plant that gives us shade. Today, where are you in this story? Were you living in the first half of life or the second half of life? Are we still trying to construct this container of our identity, of our future, of our feelings, and we will, uh, we, we will defend that identity no matter what? Or are we willing to enter into the second half of life where we're not so much worried about the container of life, but we're worried about what's in it? That is more important. Yes, life is hard and we lose things that we love. And because we lose things that we love, we don't want to lose more things that we love. And so our brains are always thinking, can't you lose? You can't lose. They're out to take it and they're out to take it and they're out to take it and don't lose what you have. But no one's coming to get what you have because we live in a world of abundance. There's plenty, and all of it is a gift. Every person is a gift. Every situation is a gift because God is good. And so maybe today, let us change our perspective from building and protecting and defending our container to seeing the world as a gift that we could put in love and relationships and empowerment and the gift that God gives us here and change our perspective from one of scarcity to one of abundance, from one of self-preservation to freely giving love, from one of seeing others as a threat to seeing others as a gift. Today, the first will be last and the last will be first but good. Yes. Those who have previously been left out, they will be included. Those who didn't have enough, now they'll have enough. Those who have been considered last over and over and over again, now they're going to be the first pick. They're going to be in the front of the line and let's celebrate that. Yes. For me, I've been first a lot in life. I don't need to be first anymore. I want to help some others be first because that's the work that God's doing and I want to be part of that work that God's doing. And in that process, it actually makes me more first 
and I don't mean that like I get more, but I, I changed my perspective from one of always trying to be first to now helping others be first. And my life has changed from, th from building the container to seeing life as a gift. And now I'm more full and I'm more blessed and I have a different perspective on life and I am surrounded in love. And that to me is what life's all about. So yes, in the kingdom of God where the first will be last and the last will be first, I'll go to the back of the line so that someone can have my seat have my space because they need it today who in your life needs to be first who can you help empower who can you help bless how can we worry less about physical damage to property and more about people's futures people's lives the Ninevites the last the least the hurting the ones crying out, the ones who are desperate to have someone come along and say, come on, I've got a new future for you. Today, may we be the people who pour out our lives for the benefit of those around us. Amen. to the end. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I just want to reach out through the screen and give you a hug. So just feel that today. Even a, that's a real social distance hug for sure. Thanks for being part of what God's doing here at Open Table. Please remember to continue your giving. OpenTableUMC.org. Thank you so, so, so much for that. I'm looking forward to us being together, those of you that can come and worship inside beginning October 4th. Uh, lots of things also missionally are going on here, so be sure to mark your calendars for that as well. Now may you go and may you see life as a gift and every single person around you as a gift. May you be covered in gift and use God's gifts for the generous outpouring of your life for the world around you. And now, may you be covered in the love and joy of Jesus Christ. Hope you have a great week. See you soon.